So we're in our series, At Home with God. Last week we talked about that wherever God is, that's where home is because we are made in his image. We are made to be like him. And he's the one who completes us, who fills us, who makes us whole. But then he gave us really good news. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven. We can be at home now by inviting God to live in our lives. And this beautiful truth that when we invite God into our lives, not only are we home, but God moves in and makes his home with us. But sometimes I want a little bit more tangible. Okay, what does that look like? How do I live at home with God? What does it look like to have God walk with me in life and to live with him every day? Well, Moses, before um, he was about to die, he knew that the time was coming close because God had told him he didn't get to go into the promised land because he had made some mistakes. And so God said the consequences were he didn't get to go into Canaan. And so before Moses dies, Moses writes the book of Deuteronomy. And in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is like, how can I teach these people? How can I give them what's most important to help them know how to live in this land, this new home that they've been waiting for? And so Moses, as he's processing with God, what can I share with the people? First, he goes through and he recounts all the different ways that God has shown up in Israel's history. My friends, this is a really important piece as we're trying to learn to make ourselves at home with God, to try to introduce God into our home. How often do you recount the ways that God has shown up in your life? My friends, when we think of what God has done in the past, it gives us hope for the future. It gives us hope for our present. It gives us hope for our current understanding and our current situations and our current struggles and everything else. Because sometimes it's so hard to, you know, actively feel like God is here when things are hard or difficult or they're not quite how I want them to be. But when I look back and I see 2020, I know God has shown up in your life. I know he's shown up in mine. And time and time again, God has made a way. And so Moses, as he's starting the book of Deuteronomy, he recounts how God has led in the past to set the people up for what they need to do as they go into the promised land. Then Moses reminds them. He reminds them about the Ten Commandments. He says, remember, remember how God showed up on the mountain and he showed up in fire and storms and smoke and lightning and how he spoke to you and you were terrified and you said, Moses, you go talk to God because we, we're we scared he's going to kill us. And so Moses says, I went and talked to God and I came back and I shared with you the Ten Commandments. And that's kind of where we're picking up the story. Before we do, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are God. Lord, we thank you that you move in with us. We thank you that you want to be with us. Lord, we thank you that you want to live with us and walk with us. Now, Lord, give us wisdom. Help us to understand what it looks like to actually live in our day-to-day, our everyday life with you. What what routines and habits, what do we need to do to um, build you into the rhythm and the routine of our lives. And Lord, we just pray that you show up and that you speak, that it's your words that are heard, not mine. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 32, it says, So Moses told the people, you must be careful to obey all the commands of the Lord your God, following his instructions in every detail. Stay on the path the Lord your God has commanded you to follow. Then you will live long and prosperous in the land you're about to enter. So Moses has just gone through the Ten Commandments and he's like, guess what? You must remember every detail. Pay attention to these things. Obey God. And sometimes we're like, yeah, I just want a relationship with God. I don't want to have to obey God. But my friends, the two go hand in hand. Jesus is telling his disciples just before he goes to heaven, if you love me, keep my commandments. We talked a little bit about this last time. There's the idea that the one of the ways that we have a relationship with God, because God knows all, he sees all, that he is perfect and he's fully loving, is that he knows what's best for us. So when God tells us to do something, even if we don't understand it, part of the relationship piece is learning to trust God and to obey him. Moses is going to talk about obedience a lot in the book of Deuteronomy, a lot. 
and he needs to because the children of Israel have a really short memory. They just keep forgetting all the things that God has done all the way through the wilderness. They kept forgetting. They would go somewhere and God would walk them through the Red Sea. And then a little while later, they'd run out of water and they're like, Moses, why'd you bring us out here in the desert to die? And then God gives them water from the rock. And then something else happens. They run out of food. And Moses, why'd you bring us out here in the desert to die? You see, they had this short memory. And Moses knows this. So he keeps going on and on and on about obey God, obey God, trust God. What he's saying is God knows more than you do. You can trust that he sees things that you don't see. You can trust him that he knows things that you don't know. So obey him even if you don't want to. We're going to continue on in Deuteronomy chapter 6 where Moses says, these are the commands, the decrees and regulations that the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you're about to enter and occupy. You and your children and your grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. There's so many beautiful things in this short paragraph. Moses is saying, we've got to obey God. We've got to trust him. He says, listen, listen carefully, obey carefully, pay attention. And he says, it's very interesting. Not just you. This isn't once and done. This isn't, okay, I'm going to sign on the dotted line. I have a contract and now we're good to go. And so I'm, you know, in God's family. God's my God. I'm his people. That's good. Just like in a marriage, just because I signed the marriage certificate doesn't mean I'm done. It means that daily, for as long as you live, Moses says, for as long as you live, you need to obey the commands. You see the commands, the Ten Commandments are actually written in covenant language. It's actually a marriage contract between God and his people. So he says, you want to know how to be at home with me? Well, marry me. Let me love it on you and obey my commands and I'll teach you how to live your life. And he says, it's not just for you, but it's for your kids and your grandkids for as long as you live. So this is perpetual. It keeps on going. That means the covenant that God has made is with you and me years and years later. God has made a new covenant through Jesus that he's written on our heart, but it's the same thing. It's the same type of covenant where he wants a relationship and we can learn so much as we dive into this. And so Um, Moses is saying, you've got to obey. You've got to listen. It's for as long as you live. God's going to give you the blessings that he's promised. He's going to take care of you. But that's not the good part. The good part is the relationship with God. And the way that we get that, the way that we get to know God, is we begin to understand how he functions. We begin to understand how he works. And we do that by reading our Bibles. We do that by spending time with him. And we do that by obeying his commands. And in order to obey his commands, I need to know his commands. So in order to know his commands, I need to have been taught them. I need to read them. The Holy Spirit has to convict me and I have to go on this journey. And so Moses is like, it's a process. It's a day-to-day process. Then here's where the Shema comes in. In chapter four, it says, listen, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one or the Lord alone. You must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. This is the Shema. And it was so important um, for the Jews that they would repeat it twice a day, a good Jew repeated this verse twice a day, that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. In fact, when Jesus is asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus quotes this verse in Deuteronomy. He says to love the Lord your God with all your soul and strength. And then he says, and the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. You see what's happening here. Moses has just read the Ten Commandments. He's just reiterated the Ten Commandments. And the rest of Deuteronomy, he's going to go into and he's going to spell out different ways that we can follow God. And the hard thing about it is I don't have the book of Deuteronomy memorized. Like I know the Ten Commandments, but I don't know all the other regulations. And like when you read them in Exodus and you read them in Deuteronomy and then throughout the whole Bible, I can feel like I'm never going to measure up and I'm not going to be good enough and I'm not going to obey enough. And I just, I'm, I'm going to miss out on this relationship. And what Jesus does is he takes the pressure off. Yes, there's obedience. God has called us to obedience. But obedience is all to love. 
God sums up all of the Ten Commandments in loving God. And then you can't love God without loving the things that God loves, and that's people. And so when we love God, we naturally love other people. And so Jesus says the first, um, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so Moses, as he's going through this, he's teaching the people that you don't necessarily need to memorize every nuance and detail of everything. But if you understand that the principle that guides us is a love for God, and a connection with him and a, and a following the prompting of the Holy Spirit and letting him lead and guide our lives and we're going to be okay. And he's going to teach us how to go about living our lives. So Moses gets into some practicalities here in verse 7. Chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Repeat them again and again to your children. So he's saying, okay, here's some practical advice for the home. You have got to teach your kids to love God. You see, in our sinful nature, we don't naturally um, fall into loving God and seeing him everywhere and being obedient to him. Our sinful nature, we're told in Romans, is, is hostile to God. It doesn't like God. It does the opposite thing. So we have to be intentional about doing opposite things than what our sinful nature is prompting us to do. And so Moses says, okay, you want to know how to live at home with God? Well, it starts by teaching your kids. And how do you teach your kids? How many of you have been able to teach your kids by telling them how to do something once? How many of you can learn something by just doing it once, having somebody tell you just one time? Well, I wish that was the case. Like, I sometimes get frustrated. And I'm like, you know, I told them. I already explained it. They should know it. But the thing is, is we need the repetition. We need to go over things multiple times so that it's not just head knowledge, but it becomes ingrained in who we are. So we need those stories to go over and over again. And then the way we live our life to follow it so that it ingrains it. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but over COVID, I've decided to learn how to play the piano or actually refresh some of my skills. And so I found this piano course online. And one of the things the teacher is teaching us is the way you learn something is to get muscle memory. So he says, don't practice the whole song, practice two notes and get your fingers and used to going through those two notes and then add the third note. So one, two, three, then one, two, three, four, like figure out those notes and get it so it's so natural. And then do your right hand and then do your left hand separately and then wait a day and then try doing two notes with both hands together. But the point is, is you keep repeating and you're repeating and you're repeating until it feels natural where your hands are supposed to go as you're playing the song. The same thing is with God. And so what we do is we repeat it to our kids. We repeat God's decrees. We say, okay, this is a God of love. This is, God is teaching us a different way, a new way, and a way that's not just about me and what I want, but a way that's about him and how I can bring him glory, a way that I can share that with other people. And so Moses says, you have to repeat this to your kids. And so he's telling us what all good parents know, but this isn't just our biological kids. This is our spiritual kids as well. You see, people who are young in the faith who don't know God the same way, we need to keep teaching them God's truth. And just because you explain it eloquently one time doesn't mean that they can wrap their heads around it. It takes time to process. And all of us are on different journeys at different states, and that's okay. Because it's in the relationship that a mom and a dad have with a kid that as we keep teaching, that's where our bond grows. That's where they learn that they can trust us, that they can come to us when things are hard or difficult, that they can share their tough emotions with us because we accept them and we help them process and we teach them a a good way to do things. And that's what it is with God. And so God is saying um, through Moses that we need to repeat these commands, that the Lord our God is, uh, he's only one. He's, he alone is God in our lives and he alone can give us what we're looking for. And what we need to do is love him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And you see what that is, is the heart back in those days was the seat of intellect. It's what I, how I thought and how I processed. So when um, he's saying love the Lord with all your heart, it's love the Lord with your mind. So intentionally choose 
to love God, intentionally choose to get to know him more, intentionally choose to spend more time, you know, learning more about him through the Bible and through prayer and through other wise advisors, people in your life who can teach you more about God. So love him with your heart, with your intellect, but love him with your soul. Your soul was the seat of emotions. That's what they understood the soul was. And so um, for them, he said, not only intellectually love God, but love him with your being. Be passionate about him. Get excited about him. And the more we love God, the more exciting it, it is. You know, the woman at the well is talking to Jesus and he tells her that I have living water for you, water that's going to spring up inside of you and it's going to overflow. And she doesn't quite get that. But my friends, that's what God is offering us in this relationship with him. And the more time we spend getting to know him intellectually, as we begin to process, he begins to help us transform our emotions and it begins to bubble up inside of us and bubble out this love, this joy, this passion for him that's contagious. And then he says, love the Lord your God with all your strength. This is what you do. This is how you act. So we can't just intellectually be Christians. We can't just be excited about it. It has to translate into how we live our lives. And so as we're teaching our kids, we need to teach them to love God with the things that they think about and love God with their passions and love God with how they live and how they act their life. And the best way to teach is to model. You know, people say, do what I say, not as I do. Well, that's the worst way to teach. The best way to teach someone is to model for them. And so Moses continues on and he's like, here's how you model it. Here's how you teach people. And so in verse six, um, Deuteronomy 6, 6, it says, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I'm giving you today. So in other words, you can't half-heartedly do this. You can't decide I'm going to do this 10 minutes a day. Like, Having a relationship with God is all day, every day. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to spend all day, every day in Bible study or prayer. But it means all day, every day, we are living a life trying to be in tune with God, trying to stay connected to Him and following Him. And then he says in verse 7, Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road. So here's two places we can teach God, um, our kids. So in other words, when we're at home, doing all the stuff we normally do at home, doing homework, doing chores, you sitting um, around watching TV, playing games together, um, being frustrated because something's not going well, handling disputes between, you know, mom and dad or other people. Like home is where kids get to see life in the real raw state. Home is where there's less, um, show that's put on. When we go out, ten, people tend to, you know, put on their makeup and look good and smile and be good. But when we're home, you know, KJ gets to see me without makeup. My hair looks a mess. I'm wearing, you know, grubby clothes. And, you know, he sees me when I'm frustrated and he sees me when I'm happy. And all of those are times that I need to point him to God. You see, in the home, every instance is an opportunity to teach our kids to see God at work. You know, even in the hard times, you know, God is at work. He's at play. So in the home, in our raw state, in the state we're most comfortable in, God is saying through Moses, teach your kids about God. So don't just, home is not where you get to relax and where you get to check off and I don't have to be on duty. No, we're supposed to be looking to God and asking God to lead and guide our lives. And we're supposed to let our kids in on that journey. And so we let them in, and when we make a mistake, we handle it like we're supposed to as Christians. We apologize, and we let them see that we apologize to people, and we let them know, and we, we process with them, and we're, we're modeling how to live that life. But then he doesn't just say, at home is where we disciple kids. He says, on the road. So those are, that encompasses all of life. So it's when you're home, and then when you're out. So when you're out and about and you're walking and somebody cuts you off in traffic and you use special language, <laughs> you can say, you know what? God doesn't really like it when I do that. And mommy's working on that. God is working on mommy. You know, we can be honest with our kids. And it's we don't just teach people by when we do it well and perfectly, but we help point our kids to God and how he's in all aspects of our lives when we will admit to them that we made a mistake and that God convicted us on that and that he's working with us and that I'm not perfect too. And so there's this teaching that happens in the home and there's this teaching that happens on the road and it 
it's not a classroom and it's not a workbook. It's life and it's letting our kids into our life. So if we're going to teach our kids about God in our life, we have got to learn to connect with God through our lives, throughout all our lives. We are told to pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians. And that means we're never supposed to stop praying. And, and Jesus, he was always connected to the Father. You see, what this looks like is me in my head. I'm having this spiritual conversation with God where I'm saying, God, what do you think about this? God, you know, I just messed up. How do I deal with this? God, um, where, where are you at work? How can I be part of that? God, what should I eat for breakfast? God, what should I wear today? You know, God, that person is driving me nuts. Like, The whole thing in our head, we are having this conversation. All the thoughts we have, instead of talking to ourselves, we are directing them to God and giving God permission to speak to us and to respond. And then we are in tune with him and we are listening. And as we do this, and as we kind of dictate this, we repeat it again and again, that we have to love God with our heart, our soul, and our minds. And we tell our kids that, and then we let them watch us live this Christian life, we are teaching them what it means to be a Christian. I heard a story um, a while ago about a group of monkeys, and this group of monkeys um, loves bananas like all monkeys do, and there's this pole that some scientists set up, and at the top of the pole is this big bunch of bananas. And um, so these monkeys are there and the monkeys go to climb the pole to get the bananas. And when they climb, when they go to get on the pole and they climb the pole, which they can easily climb, they get shocked because the pole has electricity running through it. And so they jump off. And so after a while, another monkey comes and tries it. And so for the first little bit, monkeys are trying to get up the pole, but they keep getting shocked every time they try to get it. What scientists noticed then was the group of monkeys, even though there's these luscious bananas at the top of the pole, the monkeys stopped climbing the pole. And in fact, something very interesting would happen is when a baby monkey or a new monkey that was introduced to the group would come and try to climb the pole. And by this time, the scientists had turned off the electricity so the monkeys could have gotten to the top and gotten the bananas. But by this time, Um, the group has learned that the pole is bad and the pole hurts us. And so when the monkeys would go to climb the pole, somebody else in the group would stop them from climbing the pole. They would stop them. And even though the danger had been taken away, the monkeys didn't know that because of their experience. And they they shared that in generations. They, They passed it on. So it got years later and the first monkeys who'd experienced it were gone, but the monkeys still would never climb the pole for the bananas. You see, my friends, that's what God wants for us. He wants us to share, to pass down our learnings, our teachings. And unlike the monkeys, there is always danger in our world and there's always a need to love God. And so we need to pass this to our kids. And the best way to do that is to model it and to repeat it over and over again, to share stories of God, to share what he's done in our lives in the past, to read the Bible with our kids, but to model that life that is in tune and alive with God. Then Moses continues, he says, not only should you do it when you're at home and when you're on the road, but you should do it when you get up and when you sit down. So if you didn't think at home and on the road covered everything, he's like basically every moment of your life, whether you're standing or whether you're laying down in bed, whether you're getting up to go somewhere, whether you're sitting back down, like every opportunity is an opportunity to talk about God. And you're like, how? My friends, every moment of every day, God is doing something in your life. He is, he's given you oxygen to breathe. He's helped you working out your problems. He's there with you through stressful days. Like, and the more we look for God, the more we see him. And so this is a call for us to pay attention to who God is and what he's doing in our life. And then if that wasn't enough, we're supposed to teach our kids when we're at home or on the road, whether we're standing up or we're laying down, it doesn't matter what we're doing. But then he goes on to say, um, Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. It says, tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as a reminder. Now, um, 
most likely during this time when Moses is talking about this, they understood that this was metaphorical. But as things got further down the road, and as people are trying to be good Christians or good Jews, they actually literally started tying boxes of Bible verses to their foreheads and on their arms. But that's not what God is telling us to do. He's not wanting us to walk around with a box in the middle of our eyes. He says, I want this to become a part of you. I want my love I want you to understand that all that I'm asking you to do is out of love. So if you love me, if it becomes a part of you, it's going to naturally flow out of you. It's going to flow out of you to your kids. And But he doesn't stop there. It doesn't just flow out of us to our kids. He says, put them on your gates and on your doorposts. So this goes away from the home and out to the community. So what God is saying is what happens here? Moses, as tell the people as they're going into this land of Canaan, if they make this commitment to obey me, to follow my decrees, and just to love me and to be in tune with me every day, if they live a life that models that, that their kids see and that they can grasp and they can wrap their heads around so that they can do the same thing, and they repeat it over and over again. It's not a one and done lesson. It's a daily moment by moment lesson, just like we are constantly constantly needing to be in tune with the Holy Spirit as he leads us and guides us. He says, not only will this impact their kids, but it will go out the door of your home and out the gate. It will go into the community. Jesus tells us this when he gives us the great commission to go and make disciples. You want to know the best way to make disciples? It's not to sit them down and make them believe everything you believe, but it's to live life with them. Let them see you in action. Let them see the struggles and let them see the good things and the bad things. It's to spend more time with your people like Jesus did and to just let them live life with you. And that's how a young um, baby Christian might begin to grow up, even if they're adults or older than you physically. You see, that's how we, we take this to the community, these principles, this discipleship that we teach at home and how we live our lives and how we navigate things and how we process with our kids. That's how we disciple people. You know, we ask our kids questions. Well, why did you do that? Well, and like questions are a great piece to this thing. And so what Moses is saying is you're going into the land that God's about to give you. If you want to know how to be at home with God, obey him. Like be really intentional about obeying him. And in order to obey him, you've got to spend time knowing him. You And we know him by spending time in his word and by spending time with people who know him. And then he says, this isn't just for you. It's got to be passed on to generation to generation. So we have very important responsibilities to share this with our biological kids and our spiritual kids. It is so important that we pass this on. And the best way to do it is by repetition. And it's not just by repeating the same class over and over again. It's by living life with people so they can see in the daily rhythms and routines of your life how God is part of it, how you make him a priority, how you respond to him, and how you you let him lead you and guide you. And that's what God wants for us. As you continue reading on, Moses, he goes on and he says a whole bunch of stuff. He's like, you're going to get into the land and you're going to have a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't yours and you didn't work for. So be careful not to forget God because you see sometimes when things start going well, that's when it's easiest to let our relationship with God slip a little bit. We don't have to be quite as intentional because we don't need him quite as much. But you see, in the good times, it's God who gave them to us. In the hard times, it's God who's seeing us through. And we need to keep that perspective. And then he goes on a little bit later and he says, and when you get into the land, don't worship other gods. Like, don't worship false gods. Like, that's going to be a really bad thing. Don't do that. Don't get mixed up. There's only one God, the Lord. And my friends, most of us aren't tempted to worship another God, like Zeus or something else. But we have gods. We have... um our agendas. We have our work. We have the things we're passionate about, the things that we put ahead of God, the things that get more of our time than our relationship with God. And Moses is warning us about this, especially when you're living the good life. Be careful that things are not creeping in and getting your priority ahead of God, because that will be very dangerous. Then in Exodus chapter 6 verse 20, It says, in the future, your children will ask you. I don't know about you, but kids ask a lot of questions. And it's good because they're curious and they're excited about the world. They're excited about life and they want to know things. My son will randomly say, you know, what's the longest a hippo's ever lived? I'm like, 
I don't, I don't know. He's like, well, ask Siri. And so we'll look it up and we'll ask Siri or we'll Google it or something like that. But he has these amazing questions, things that I would never even think to ask. And so in verse 20, it says, in the future, your kids will ask you, what is the meaning of these laws, um, decrees and regulations that the Lord our God has given us to obey? So kids aren't going to understand why it's important. Um, spiritual babies aren't going to necessarily understand why it's important. And they'll ask the questions. And when they ask the questions, it becomes a teachable moment. And here's this beautiful picture of what it looks like to live teaching. Here's a picture of Moses describing what would have been Passover celebration. And so in Exodus chapter 6, verse 21, it says, You must tell them we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. The Lord did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrible blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so we he could give us this land he has sworn to give our ancestors. The Lord our God commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear him so he can continue to bless us and preserve our lives as he has done to this day. For we will be counted as righteous when we obey the commands the Lord our God has given us. This is set in the scene of the Passover celebration. And if you know anything about the Jewish routines and rituals in the Passover celebration, the story would be recounted how God had freed them from Israel and how God had shown up. And then the father would bless the kids, and there was all of this thing, that, these teaching moments, and they would actually break the bread. They would eat the unleavened bread, and they would, they would eat the stuff that they ate on that Passover night, and the stories would be told. And my friends, this is an example of what Moses is trying to get across. So as you're going into the land, he's saying, I want you to model when kids ask questions, invite them in, retell the stories about how God has shown up, you know, point them to Bible verses that give them principles that deal with bullying or sports or whatever they're going through in their everyday life, you know, point them to biblical princesses, principles and process with them how they can make decisions and how they could do better. And when they're, you ask them, you know, so what do you hear God saying? If they come up with a good idea, you can say, well, maybe God put that in your head. We can help them learn to hear God's voice all these amazing things. And so he's saying model and share the stories. There are stories in your life. I know growing up, there are stories of how God, you know, got us through and my dad didn't have paychecks, you know, how we ate the same cereal over and over again, how it kept being enough, even though we'd eat it all gone. There are stories of how we found money in vents. There are stories about us living in the bus and how God provided. There's all these amazing stories that we would recount growing up. And what we need to do is develop those stories in our families. So how has God moved so that as we teach our kids, we're giving them hope and they can see tangibly how God is at work. My friends, this is what it looks like to be at home with God. It looks like obedience to God. It, it, it's choosing intellectually to get to know God and to obey what he's convicting me and telling me to do. But then it's asking God to align my emotions, to bring my heart in, my soul, so that um, my love for him bubbles up. It's remembering that it's not about checking the, off all of the laws and the letter of the law, but it's about the principle of love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It's about being all in and all God's laws are encompassed in love. And so if we love God and trust him, then we will obey him when he tells us to do something and he will lead us through the tricky world that we live in. And the way we teach this to our kids is not by getting them in the right class with Pastor Jen or with somebody else or by taking them through the perfect little booklet or um, like it's by living life with them. It's by being real. It's by modeling what it looks like to be a Christian. It's by letting them see the good, the bad, and the ugly, the easy and the hard. And by pointing them to God in all aspects of our life. You know, God tells us in Romans that God's invisible qualities are everywhere to be seen, so we have no excuse. I can walk outside right now and point to an amazing God creator who has a beautiful imagination because of just the, the variance in the trees and the flowers. And so God is calling us to love him and to trust him. My friends, will you make the commitment to have God in your home by doing these things? We need to repeat it and we need to share it not only with our kids, but take it into our communities and share it with people that God puts in our lives. 
I'd like to ask you to make some commitments today, but first let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you bless us, that you lead us and guide us, and that you help us to be all in. Lord, teach us to obey you, but teach us to love you. And then Lord, um, help us to be vulnerable enough with our kids. Help us to be intentional and really be open so that they can see as we're modeling what it looks like to live for you. Lord, teach us how to point them to you every step of the day, every moment of the day. And Lord, help it to be... Um, come so ingrained in us that it's just ingrained in our kids and it's ingrained in our spiritual kids and lord i just pray that you help us to love you and to share this love and to pass it on to future generations lord we thank you for this amazing gift of relationship with you and i pray that you teach all of us how to accept it how to live it and how to share it we love you in your name we pray amen I'd like to ask you to make some commitments in your connection card, and you can do that by texting the letter CC to 301-321-8848. And the commitments are, first of all, share with someone what God said to you while hearing the sermon. It's so important for us to respond to God. Next, I want you to tell God what you're going to do about it. So there's a relationship here. So God's speaking to you. How are you going to respond? Then I want you to remember how God has led you in the past and share those stories. There's so much power in them. Write them down. Find a way to remember. And I want you to understand that the heart of all God's laws is love. His love is what is most important. And then teach your kids to see, hear, and obey God in all aspects of life. So everything you do is an opportunity to share God's love with your kids and to point your kids to God. So ask God to give you that intentionality and to continue to point your kids to Him. And then I want you to share the love of God with others intentionally this week. So go beyond the four walls of your home and into your community, into the world that you interact with and ask God how you can share his love this week. I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us. And I encourage you to jump on over to our Zoom call and just connect with us for a few minutes. It's a great way to stay connected and I hope to see you.